Euler's identity, the most beautiful formula in maths. I'm sure you've seen this formula countless times, and I know I've personally wondered how something like this begin to even be proven. It's an irrational number raised to an irrational number, multiplied by an imaginary number. In this video, I'm going to explore the elegance not only of this proof, but the simplicity of the method. Unfortunately, as in most videos, there are some prerequisites, although all you'll need to know is differentiation from first principles, and we will derive all the other methods. And I'm sure you've heard this a thousand times, but I want you to feel as if you could derive this yourself. This method of thinking should flow, and be intuitive, and along the way you'll learn some really interesting ideas, like small angle approximations and Taylor series. Without further ado, let's begin. The fundamental idea driving this proof is that we can model non-polynomials by polynomials. A nice stepping stone to try and do this is by deriving the small angle approximations. The first thing I'm going to say is that we're going to model cos of x by some polynomial where we have a plus bx plus cx squared where a, b and c are constants. Something I want to say before we keep going is that for a given input k, we want the original function and the approximation to be the same, which makes sense. We also need the rate of change to be the same as we're trying to model the same function. This also means that the derivatives of both need to be equal. Finally, we're also going to need the rate of that change to be equal, or in other words, we need the second derivative to match. I'm going to list these assumptions at the bottom. Next, I'm going to say that f of x is our actual function and g of x is our approximation. We'll differentiate both the functions and the eventual aim is to figure out the value of the constant a, b and c. When we differentiate cos, we get negative sign and when we differentiate negative sign, we get negative cos, which is something we proved in my last video. On the right, we will use the power rule. Something fundamental you may have noticed is that in the derivatives of our model, there is only ever a single constant term. From earlier, we know that the derivatives of both of the functions at a given point need to be equal. So let's just say that point is zero. Something interesting is going to happen. On the left, all the functions will simplify to a single number. And on the right, the functions will simplify to a single constant term. Now all we need to do is compare coefficients. a equals 1, b equals 0, and c equals negative 1 half. We can substitute these constants back into our approximation, and it's going to give us 1 plus 0x minus x squared over 2, which is the small angle approximation for cos. Just to give you an idea of how accurate this approximation really is, I'm going to draw the actual function and draw the model we've produced. We can see that at the point of x equals 0.1, our model is correct to five significant figures, which is unbelievably close. Next, we're going to derive the small angle approximation for sine. You're going to notice that although the actual function we use is different, the general form for the model we use is going to be the same, since although a, b and c are going to be different values, for now we're going to use the same letters. The method is the exact same, so I'm going to let it run in the background a little bit faster. Although in reality I'd like you to try this yourself, since it will help you appreciate the method a bit more. While this is running in the background, I'd like to take a moment to talk about why we actually care about small angle approximations. In courses such as engineering, using polynomials rather than functions like sine or cos, or as we'll see later, exponentials and logarithms, makes things a bit easier. And considering how accurate these approximations are for small values, it makes it a lot easier to just convert them. Again, I'm going to plot the original graph and the approximation, and we can see again at the point of x equals 0.1, the approximation and the actual curve produce virtually the same value. So 
Something important about these approximations is right in the name. These approximations only work for small angles. Outside of a certain range, these approximations are completely useless. You might be wondering why this approximation is so wrong outside the small range of values. And it's because I fundamentally limited your approximation by limiting the number of terms in our series. There's nothing stopping us from writing a series with an infinite number of terms. For ease of use, I'm going to stop writing the constants alphabetically and instead write C0 and C1 and C2. And we now have the fundamentals for a Taylor series. The aim is to produce an exact approximation. We're going to follow the same steps and differentiate both functions. We know from the last video that the derivatives of the base trig functions are going to be periodic. Differentiating our polynomial is going to get a bit messy since the series is infinite. So I'm going to list the first few terms of each. Don't forget, we're going for elegance, so we're going to look for a pattern. Again, we're going to substitute our point of zero, since what we're going to notice is again, we're going to get a single constant term for every single derivative. We're going to realise now that for the nth derivative of our function, we only need to differentiate the nth power of x. I want to take a step back and go back to before we differentiated it. Now, when we use the power rule, rather than just multiplying it, I want to list out the numbers we're multiplying. I'm going to go back through all the derivatives and do the exact same thing. And we're going to notice something. We're just producing the factorials. The nth derivative produces n factorial. Again, extrapolating from what we know, we can guess that the next term is going to be 4 factorial times by a constant term. We're going to match coefficients again. In the background, I'll slowly go through how we rearrange to find out the value of our constants. We're going to see that the numerator is going to be the value for our f of 0 and that the denominator is going to be the coefficient of the constant term in g of 0. We're also going to notice that the subscript of the constant term is equal to the factorial 2. Following this trend we can start to substitute into our approximation. The denominator is equal to the subscript of the constant term factorial and the numerator is equal to the derivative of f of x. Again, since this is an infinite series, we can continue to add terms. Since we know that the derivatives of sine are periodic, we can actually extrapolate following the exact same trend, where the numerators are going to be the exact same as the numerators from the first four. And the denominators are going to be the same, where the denominator is the subscript factorial. Next, we're going to notice that some of these terms have a zero in the numerator, which means we can cancel these terms out. Next, some of these terms have a negative in the numerator, so we're just going to bring these out to the side to make it look a bit cleaner. And now we can see a trend, and we can begin to extrapolate following what we know. It's an alternating sequence of the odd powers of x, where we add and then subtract. Again, I'm going to plot the approximation and plot the actual graph to see how accurate this is. Although, I'm going to increase the number of terms in each approximation so we can see the effects of including an extra term. We can see that once every term is included, this is no longer an approximation, but an exact representation of the function as a polynomial. We can use the exact same method to find out the Taylor series for cos. 
I'm going to let it run in the background, although I'd like you to try this for yourself. The next thing we need to do is generalise this. Let's just say k of x is just some random function. The next thing we need to do is generalise this. Let's just say k of x is just some random function. Again, like we've seen multiple times before, the derivatives of the approximation are going to be the exact same. The derivatives of k are actually unknown, but we're not going to need them, so we're just going to leave them like this. After expanding and simplifying and comparing coefficients, we now have the general form for a Taylor series. We can test this by using sine, since we actually know what the Taylor series is going to be. Unsurprisingly, the general form produces the exact same solution. Just to make sure that we know this works, we're also going to use cos and follow through the exact same steps. Now that we know this works, we're actually going to use this for the final function we're going to get a Taylor series for, e to the x. The thing that we need to figure out is what we get if we substitute 0 into our derivatives. We know that the derivative of e to the x is e to the x, so I'm just going to do the simplification here. Again, we can see a trend forming here, so I'm going to extrapolate and continue the Taylor series. For the last time, we're going to test our approximation against the actual function to see how accurate it is. And like magic, we produce the exact function. The next step is going to be a brief introduction to imaginary numbers. Even if you know what they are, this might be useful. All I'm going to say is that i is the square root of negative 1. What I'm doing in the background is figuring out the powers of i. We can see that i to the 1 is still equal to i. i squared is going to be minus 1, since the square for square root is going to be the value inside the square root. i cubed becomes minus i, and then i to the 4 becomes 1. Again, by factorising out, we can see that this pattern repeats again for the next set of 4. We can now predict that i to the 9 should be the same as i to the 5, which is the same as i to the 1, which is just i. We're finally here, the last step, combining all of what we have. We're going to list the three Taylor series we've produced. Now is where the magic happens, and we need to take a leap of faith. In e to the x, we're going to substitute ix for just x, and now we can substitute this into our Taylor expansion. We can now simplify this and see a trend forming.
again, following on from our leap of faith, now we're going to substitute sine of x for i sine of x. For every term in our Taylor expansion, now we're going to multiply it by i. For all the terms with the zero in the numerator, I will leave them, although I'm not going to multiply them by i, we have no value. Again, with our expansion of cos of x, all the terms with the zero in the numerator, I'm going to hide in the background. You may have already seen it, but here's the beautiful part. If we add the two trig functions together, we get exactly the same function as e to the i x. And this expansion continues forever. This isn't just the same for the first five powers of x, this is true forever. These three infinite series completely match. The final part is now easy. Just substitute pi for x, and we can simplify. As sine of pi is 0, the imaginary component falls out, and we're left with just the real part. And finally, we have it. Euler's identity. This proof is long, but unbelievably elegant. We've learned some important skills in problem solving, and learned a new method in the Taylor series. I really appreciate you watching to the end of the video. I hope you enjoyed. I really appreciate any likes and subscriptions. I've left some additional problems for any of you that have a knack for a bit more. This video took unbelievably long to make, but I hope it was useful. If you have any questions, please let me know in the comments. Thank you.